Hi, I'm Chris Nicholson, a partner with Russell Reynolds in London, focused on clean tech and energy more broadly. Thank you for joining us for our Energy Matters video series. We seek really to be bringing industrialists and investors together to debate the big themes that matter across the energy value chain, but we will principally focus on the initiatives to reduce carbon and to make returns for investors, a tough combination. We will be shortly joined by Lord John Brown, who very kindly helped us launch our event um, back in January. And today he will summarize what was a pretty lively discussion and share his views on the sector and the big themes within it. John, who many of you will know was the former CEO of BP up until 2007, has continued to be very active across the sector since then, principally around the energy transition and he's currently the chairman of Beyond Net Zero, a growth equity venture backed by General Atlantic. So Chris, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I think many people today look at the world and find a rather large number of things to cause concern. Security on Europe's eastern border can no longer be taken for granted. Energy prices are very high and rising. Climate change is changing the way we live and do business. And the signals being sent by ESG investors are reshaping financial markets. Inflation seems to have made a strong comeback. I want to make four brief points about some of these trends and what they might mean for business. My first point is about the global supply chain crunch, which is affecting the whole economy, which is having a particularly acute impact on the energy sector. Relatively poor returns and pressure from investors have perhaps contributed to a historic decline in fossil fuel investment, but we still rely on hydrocarbons to supply more than 80% of the world's energy. So it should come as no surprise that the release of pent-up demand has led to the highest ever natural gas price in Europe and the highest oil price since 2014. I believe it will take more than a few months to moderate these prices and more than a few decades to do away with an energy system that has been built over more than two centuries. High energy prices could have an important implication for efforts to address climate change. My second point. When oil prices were last in the region of $100, companies converted uh, capital. They took it away from their nascent renewable energy business and put it back to work in hydrocarbons in pursuit of a return. They maintained a rhetorical commitment to renewables, but in practice did very little. Now, of course, a lot has changed since then, but the incentives to maximize value in the short term are still overwhelming. And I fear that the natural environment doesn't stand a chance unless protecting it is the only thing preventing a company from breaking the law. And that's why I've argued that oil and gas companies should be bolder in thinking how to separate low carbon and zero carbon activity from their fossil fuel business. It would help investors to allocate their capital more efficiently and make clearer the true long-term value of the low carbon businesses embedded within oil and gas companies. Of course, those businesses need to have reached a certain state of maturity. But when it comes to climate change, we mustn't lose sight of the big picture. My third point, decarbonization needs to take place across the whole economy. And it's something that needs to be done by all of us, not just by oil and gas companies, because everything relates to everything else. Nothing exists in isolation. And that's why annual investment in climate solutions across the entire value chain needs to rise from its present level of just over a trillion dollars a year to over 3.5 trillion on average over the next decade. Investments like that can only come from the private sector, facilitated by public policy that creates incentives and reduces risk and supported by science-based targets against which progress is measured and leaders held accountable. But leadership in this area has so far been relatively poor. 
a recent global report found that just 20% of companies have made some sort of net, commit, net zero commitment, and less than two thirds of those commitments are science aligned. Evidence suggests that just 10% of companies with a net zero target have a plan for delivery. The current pace of change is not fast enough for us to be confident of reaching net zero by 2050. I'm happy to argue, however, that failure is not inevitable, my fourth and final point. I recently recorded a short podcast series called Net Zero and Beyond, looking at the people and the companies delivering practical solutions to the many problems of climate change. We talked to leaders in sectors such as aviation, steel, energy, transportation, and surprisingly, wine production. There were no easy answers on which everyone agreed, but what united these people was a belief in their ability to make a difference. As consumers, they're demanding more information about the goods and services they consume so that they can make informed, low-carbon choices. As corporate leaders, they're leading into laws and regulations that apply to everyone in order to create a level playing field. As shareholders, they're avoiding things like divestment, which make little difference to the climate, and are instead wielding their influence over corporate strategy and executive compensation. And as voters, they're lobbying for governments to take the direct, comprehensive, and sometimes blunt actions that only governments can take, such as the implementation of a transparent and universal penalty for emitting greenhouse gases and making sure that the revenue derived is distributed equitably across society. The range of different actions all add up to one thing, delivery. The real world's delivery of climate solutions has long been a preoccupation of mine, whether as CEO of BP or more recently as co-founder of Beyond Net Zero, a climate growth equity venture with General Atlantic. I know how difficult the decisions can be when there are trade-offs to be made between important ESG commitments and healthy profits. But in the end, it comes down to the conviction that the right thing to do in the short term will ultimately pay off in the long term. That is the essence of business's contract with society, and it is essential if we are to build a sustainable future for the planet on which we all depend. John, thank you very much for summarizing. And, and I, I recall we had a very lively debate after the discussion. And, and some of the big themes that, that came out were around purpose versus profit, uh, as you uh, allude to earlier. And this brings us to a question that many of our viewers and listeners would be keen to understand is in the context of the many stakeholders in, in decarbonization, um, the integrated energy companies um, are one of the key players. And as they evolve and their role evolves and changes, how do you think they should navigate this, this transition? I think it's very important that they remember, and we all remember, that the transition will not happen overnight. It, it can't be quick. Uh, and we'll be using hydrocarbons for some time. So the most important thing that we can think about, I think, is how do we decarbonize hydrocarbons? Uh, carbon capture and storage and use uh, advances in that area. These are very important things that people should focus on. I think there are many skills in the oil and gas companies which could be used to deploy new energy technologies for the future. Uh, but in the end, of course, there are they're probably very much more valuable to investors than oil and gas because they believe that new energies have high growth and oil and gas has, at best, a moderate decline, at worst, a strong decline uh, in revenues over time. So I think they, are, are, they have to make a decision on what they keep inside the company, what they don't keep inside the company, and how they transform. What they can't do and shouldn't do is to let one side hamper the other, whichever way that is. So I think that's really quite important. I, I think the other thing that 
oil and gas companies can't do is a broader question of um, how much anybody, how much energy anybody uses. And this is in the area of energy efficiency. Uh, I know that everyone was taught to turn off the lights and do things like that, but it requires individual decisions to do that. If you can take the decisions out of the hands of the individuals or out of the companies and give those decisions to machines that learn, so software that learns, then you really can begin to change the way in which we think about efficiency. Good for the climate, probably good for productivity at the same time. Mm. And looking at that conundrum through a, a leadership lens, and if I reflect back five years ago, leadership in energy was, was principally about delivery and execution, and success was principally about uh, barrels generated and profits returned to shareholders. The world has changed, expectations have changed around success, now um, very much being defined and linked to uh, planet-related um, success factors. Uh, what does that mean for a leader now in a, in a large integrated energy company? It, does it require a transformational change in the definition of success? I think that uh, change has um, been coming along for some time now. Uh, clearly, making good returns is important for investors, but making them in the right way is even more important. Making them in the right way today is now termed as are you doing the right thing when it comes to environment, social matters, and governance, ESG? And in each of those cases, it's very important to establish your credentials, to, to say what you're going to do, measure what you've done against what you say you're going to do, and do it again and again and again. Environment was always the slightly uh, creative area where you had to describe what you're doing. I think we have now tools and techniques to, to illustrate the single most important thing. That's not the only important thing, but it's the most important thing, which is we have to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. And that's the objective. How you do it, there are many different ways, many different ways depending on which industry you're in and what state of development you're in. But in the end, it's that. Of course, there are other very important social matters are uh, very important indeed. Uh, and clearly there's no silver bullet in decarbonisation when you think of any one technology that, that might uh, change the world. But is there one that you're particularly excited about, if I was to force your hand? No, uh, there, I, I, I'm not going to go into saying there's one, there's, there isn't mm -hmm. a silver bullet. Uh, I, I think, you know, we have to think about some things very important. How, how, how do we create base load electricity uh, as we reduce the amount of hydrocarbons being used in electric power generation? This is very important. Now, it will, will nuclear have a bigger role? I have a feeling it probably will. Uh, so that's one area. Second area is how do we decarbonize hydrocarbons for as long as we need them? You know, uh, I think there are plenty more advances there. Thirdly, can we use all the things we know and we're about to discover in AI uh, and machine learning to make sure that we actually do become more and more efficient and we use just exactly what we need, the limited amount of resource to get the maximum impact. That's very important. I just picked those three areas, but I can pick many more. And the reason I would say this is, I do actually think everything is related to everything else. You can't just change one thing. So when you start talking about decarbonization, it's looking at the whole chain, everything is related. And you can't just have one technology solving all the problems. Understood. And there are a whole raft of new technologies that are on the horizon, but not yet commercially viable. And I've heard you talk about nuclear fusion and, and other such topics in, in the past. Are there any out there that you think may come through and be proven out that will be impactful and change our thinking? I think there are quite a few. The brains of the world are being drawn into the venture space here, and there are lots and lots of ideas, lots and lots of startups, and some which are now becoming emerging growth companies. Uh, you know, it's interesting that there's been a revival, for example, in, in small-scale nuclear reactor design. I think that's very exciting. 
for the world. It's exciting that people have been to think how to make green steel and green cement. You know, these are things on the horizon. They're not here today because they're complicated pieces of integrated activity uh, that will just take time to pull together. John, I appreciate your time. So thank you again for joining us and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you.